Khiana literally means betrayal. So Khiana, Daesh, the left, and the undermaking, uh, undermaking of the Syrian revolution. We're lucky here today to have three of the writers of the book. We have uh, Mark uh, Bortroyd, he's an NHS staff nurse, a uh, uh, socialist activist, and the founder of Syria Solidarity UK. We have uh, uh, Mohammed Idris, he's a lecturer in digital journalism, and he's an author of The Road to Iraq. And we have uh, Javad al -Bur. he's an artist and a writer and a, social, uh, so, and a socialist based in North uh, England. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, each of the speakers will have 15 minutes, and then we will open the floor for questions. 15 minutes? 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Mark. I'm um, one of the founders of Serious Solidarity. And I was sort of, I wanted to use kind of partly my experiences to frame uh, some of the discussion we have around uh, the Syrian revolution and, and what, what led to writing this book and, you know, why we called it Kiana and why we think that, you know, some of the, the betrayal of the Syrian revolution merits a book and why, and the ways it's contributed to the desperate situation that the Syrian people find them in um, today. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I frequently get asked, you know, why, what, what drew me to Syria? Why did I get involved? And yeah, it, it, it's, it's a, it is a strange thing because I mean, I, I've got to say, I don't speak Arabic, I don't read Arabic. Uh, the closest, the longest I've spent in the Middle East is a seven hour stopover in Dubai while I'm traveling somewhere else. So I really, I, I mean, I had a British Syrian friend prior to the revolution, but I had no, no connection to, to the region, to the country, uh, you know. I'd done some Palestine solidarity activism when I was at university, obviously in an anti-war campaign, uh, but that was that was it. Um, and then sort of when, and I've been a long-time socialist campaign activist. Then when sort of the Arab Spring broke out, I think like everyone, I was you know watching watching the you know Al Jazeera, CNN, watching the demonstrations, the protests as they swept from Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and then Syria, um, and sort of so uh, like victory came relatively quickly for. Tunisia and, and, and Egypt, um, uh, and Libya a bit longer, but you know, Gaddafi was deposed within a year. But within in Syria, um, there was no there was no quick and easy victory. The violence just kept escalating. The peaceful protests were, uh, you know, bombed off the streets, and it, it quickly the revolution quickly, uh, well, it, after about six to nine months, became this revolutionary war between the populace and the, and the regime. Uh, extremely bloody, brutal, and, and, and is you know going to is going to be remembered as one of the most brutal conflicts, I think, of the, the 21st century. And um, so sort of watching all this, this history of activism behind me, I was looking around, I was seeing nothing happening. Nothing, there was no protest marches against the bombings, there was no real sort of solidarity organizing, you know, when the Assad regime started to, you know, bomb civilian areas, shoot Scud missiles at Aleppo or Homs or ha um, Hama and other places. And, you know, I was just kind of shocked at this, you know, if, if this was happening to, to sort of, to, to Gaza or Iraq or anything, that the left would be up in arms, there'd be massive demonstrations. But for some reason with Syria, there was, there was nothing, you know, there was no, no protests. Um, I started to try and do fundraising. Met Syrians did 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 kind of campaign alongside us to raise to raise money for humanitarian aid. We had discussions about what they were doing. And, you know, they, some of them said they were like, "Oh, yeah, we went to stop the war. We asked them for support, but they said they couldn't they couldn't do anything because the struggle had nothing to do with to do with Britain." Um, so, and so this kind of shocked me, and I began to organise meetings myself. Uh, met other Syrian activists, began to meet other leftist activists who were also in the same position where they were watching this brutal conflict unfold. They see no no action from from the you know left wing socialist revolutionary organisations in in Britain, and so you know the, the conflict was dragging on. That uh, you know 100,000 people killed in the first two years. You know, uh, whole country at war. You know, Massive intervention from Iran, Hezbollah, from sectarian militias to huge sectarian massacres across the country, as you know, the the, the regime actively worked to stir up sectarian strife, <coughs> and, and 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 very little, you know, campaigning on it. And um, so, sort of around um, you know 2013, began to meet activists, 
people like Eva Jesuit, who's a, a, a British Polish activist who went to Syria in 2013 and went to Maratol Numan and in Idlib, met the revolutionaries there on the ground who were self organizing, and we started to organize meetings and discussions. and. Um, we started to build up a small network of people, and then sort of you had the 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 the, um, the, the Ghouta massacre, the when Assad used chemical weapons against um, the suburbs of Damascus. And I think this is actually, um, you know, going to probably get me remembered actually as a very shameful episode for the left and anti-war movement, because this movement, which had been silent for the last two years, Assad had committed all these sectarian massacres, suddenly came onto the streets when that same regime. <laughs> with military intervention because it had used chemical weapons and killed 1,500 people. And there was no, it wasn't, it wasn't no, there was no protest about the, about the, um, about the use of chemical weapons, the fact that this is a massive massacre. It was, oh no, we don't want this regime being bombed. Now, I mean, I'm not, I'm not in favor of inter intervention generally and these sorts of things, but there was, you know, the fact that it wasn't the, the gassing of 1,500 people were bought on the street, but the threat of a military response to that, which actually would have maybe disabled the regime and stopped it being able to massacre its people. Um, you know, they, um, and I think this kind of, this showed that actually for a lot of the left and the anti-war movement, this was the, they, they felt this was like a rerun of 2003, that the, you know, the West was going to go in and invade and occupy, and really it showed a lack of understanding about the situation, the difference, the fact there was a, the popular revolution, the people were trying to actively trying to throw off this uh, regime, and, and they were actively calling for help and support, which was actually being, being you know, um, denied them. And, and the, the left's approach of kind of hands off Syria actually fed into this because it was like, yeah, they wanted hands off, they didn't want intervention. To, uh, parts of the, I think, unfortunately, the left, Stalinist left, um, you know, parts who were pro, pro Ba'athist were very happy with to use these slogans and hide behind them because it, it served, you know, they could pretend to just be, um, you know, against intervention when actually really they were pro regime and they wanted to stop. Active, any active support for the revolutionary movement on the ground. So they kind of hid behind these slogans and parts of the anti-war movement accommodated them and weren't willing to break with them. And we found this when trying to engage as serious solidarity activists, that there was a, a barrier, like a both, um, you know, like an ideological barrier, which people say, well, it's not Britain involved, it's not Britain bombing, so what are we doing? So why, why, how can we support them? It's like, well, we do, we support them the same way we would support anyone. You raise funds, you have protests, you raise awareness. And, and actually, there's a lot of good examples of, um, uh, of, of, of areas where even like peaceful protests, public protests, have shifted the regime. There was a, a Syrian filmmaker who was locked up uh, by the regime for, for being part of the opposition, filming um, the opposition. And uh, in response, a, some enterprise, some sympathetic directors in Hollywood all signed a petition to have it released. And you know, this is not like, you know, it's just a petition, but the fact that all these famous Hollywood actors signed it, he was out within, within you know, a few days, and he was released, because they didn't, because the regime, the most important thing for the regime was its image. It wanted to create this image of a, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a bastion of secularism fighting a jihadist sectarian war, and actually it's being criticized publicly by, you know, big Hollywood names didn't help. <laughs> Didn't help this, so it was willing to, you know, when things actually hit attacked its image, it, it would, it would, it would let people out of prison, or if conditions would improve, there's the, the uh, on the ground because it would, it would um, retreat from some of its more brutal excesses. So there was a real, I mean, what this showed is that actually, if we had built this movement, if there was solidarity, then it would have had a, a concrete effect. I mean, there were, there were very, I mean, a lot of these things are actually what Syrians, the examples of this, are what Syrians that did themselves. Uh, in in uh, Moadamia, which is a besieged area just outside Damascus, uh, um, a, the spoke, one of the spokespeople for the the town um, went on a, a hunger strike, and he against the the siege of the besieging of the town, the stopping of aid getting in, and he, he it became an international thing. He got loads of intellectuals, journalists, famous figures around the world to join in this this hunger strike, and it began to get international attention. So what, and what did the regime do? They, they allowed aid into the town. Not much, it wasn't a huge amount, but they, they gave in, basically, through peaceful public, you know, protest resistance. And, and led, but this was, I mean, this was led by Syrians on the ground, because none of it was being actually coordinated from outside. There wasn't this solidarity movement to do it, because they, people hadn't, hadn't, hadn't built it up. And this, um, you know, and I think this, this is why sort of the, the thing of betrayal comes in, because these, these small examples can show what could have been done, what could have been done differently over the last four or five years. You know, real act of solidarity, real listening to, actually trying to listen to, to Syrians and, and follow, you know, what they, they were asking for. I mean, there's a, 
uh, you know, there's a good quote um, which you can read in the book in one of my articles, a British Syrian journalist who wrote in August 2013 um, about the anti-war demonstration. He said, the upcoming protests and its slogans embody an essence of white supremacy mentality, imposing their beliefs and demands on the Syrian people's revolution. No intervention, hands off Syria, not slogans that come from Syria, far from it. Um, therefore, one must assume that they are slogans that are being imposed on the Syrian people. And this is very much what's happening, is, is, is you know, uh, leftist groups were imposing their own narrative from 2003, or you know, going back to the Cold War era, that this was like a proxy war um, funded by the US and Britain rather than a, a popular revolution. And um, you know, this and uh, this has led to a disastrous situation where actually, you know, the, the you know the revolution, which is still continuing, which is still fighting on the ground, which still during the, the ceasefire, um, you know, two months ago was, you know, came back out onto the streets, thousands of people staging peaceful protests, the same slogans from the early days of the re revolution being being sung again, still very much alive, but people don't know about it. It's not really talked about when it should be the. That I mean, it should be, you know, for anyone who, who has a hope for progressive change in the Middle East and around the world, this should be a big, a major focus of, of, of trying to keep this revolution alive, trying to support it, trying to make people know about it, because it is the only progressive alternative in Syria. The regime is never going to retake Syria, and if it does, it will only do it by committing a massive genocide. Uh, and the and Daesh will, will will grow off that if you know the sectarianism, the vicious massacres and stuff continue. It will grow in strength, and if this if the revolution and the you know the, the the more principled you know armed groups which protect it are are extinguished because of the Russian intervention and the violence of the regime, then then I'm very uh, then I'm I'm very worried about the future of Syria uh, and and what will, uh, the future of the whole region because there is there there will not be any progressive solution to that. But I think that's what part of writing the book, part of getting these uh, arguments out there is to ch is to challenge this this dominant narrative that it's you know that this is just a sectarian war and a sad maybe bad but he you know that you, um, but he's um you know he's he's better than the, these you know crazy headshot ISIS people and um uh, you know, which a view which is you know espoused by people like Boris Johnson, who was the former mayor of London. You know, this is not a minority view. This is quite there's huge chunks of you know uh, ruling political parties which support this and things. And, and um, you know, actually trying to keep alive this thing, that, this notion that actually there is a popular revolt that is is there, it can be supported, and it should be supported by everyone. And trying to pick apart some of these reactionary narratives which seek to bury that revolution and and. Uh, you know, hide the, the potential that still exists for a you know free and democratic and, and, and just Syria. So that's sort of that's sort of some of what went into to writing the, the, the book, and hopefully we can kind of continue the discussion of how we can use the book and a activism to to sort of to support the ongoing revolt and hopefully see it 